Hi, okay, so what we're gonna do now is our Friday uh, lightning talk sessions. Uh, so there are some rules with lightning talks as you, are, as you are aware of. These talks must be no more than five minutes. We have an enforcement mechanism for this five minutes. I will count down when someone has about uh, one minute left and then I'll start counting five, four, three, two, one. I'll point to you and you will throw socks at them that you will be given during uh, the course of, the, actually, probably now, we'll probably hand out socks uh, randomly. So if someone uh, just tosses out some socks, there we go. Yes, speakers will receive socks in a, an aggressive manner. I don't know, the audience will be throwing at the speaker. Okay, so I mean, I'm not. I mean, this is the, the, what, our agreement, right? Yeah. So shush, there shouldn't be anything confusion over here. All righty. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll give this a minute. Remember, these are tools. Use them responsibly, not toys. All righty, okay. I get, uh, as soon as the first person begins talking, the timer will begin. So first up, we are having a lightning talk by uh, Jonatas, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Bolden. So three small techniques to break the ice while meeting people at conferences. Okay, um, and while he's setting up, uh, there's a small little, since David likes jokes, the small joke. Um, knock, knock, race condition, who's there? Yeah, he loved it. <laughs> uh, you can have this mic, or actually, no, you should put that mic on. I need this mic to order people to throw things at you. Or, actually, actually you can, it's probably faster. You'll start with this one. Hear me? Oh, oh up, 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 up. Just get a pop, pop. Man, it's not hot. Okay, can you put some time in? Let's go running. So, uh, hello everybody. I'm Jonathan Baldwin. Uh, people call me Jojo. Uh, first of all, I want to thank every organizer, volunteer, speaker, people that gave tutorials, everyone that helped uh, make PyCon CA. Because this is a conference made by the community, the community to the community. And it's like really, really awesome travel like thousands of kilometers and come here and see this amazing community together. So today I'm gonna just give a small talk about breaking the ice at conference. So this guy, uh, Eric Holscher, he is a co-founder of Write the Docs and Read the Docs. And he wrote some articles about how you interact with people uh, when you get to a conference. So first of all, this is more for like who are organizing the conference. You should give people explicit permission to join new groups of people. So when the conference starts, just like talk like, hey, we are allowing you to join your older groups. We're allowing you to make new friends. Because people that are like really introverts or if they're first time in a conference, it's really easy to just grab a coffee and like watch other groups of people like, what the fuck am I doing here? So like it's really, really easy to get into that. So if you say to them, like, hey, you can make friends, it's nice to make friends, like, please go and talk to people, they'll be more comfortable to do that. So it's a really nice thing to do uh, if you're organizing a conference. The second one is the Pac-Man rule. Uh, when standing as a group of people, always leave a room for one person to enjoy your group, like this. So if you're like in your little group of friends, leave like a, a slice of pizza so someone can enjoy. And if someone can enjoy, like just say, hey, open a little bit more. So always have space for someone to join. Because sometimes someone pass by, like hear a nice conversation, and there's no space actual physical space to talk. So if you just open a little bit, person can go like, and hey, introduce themselves, and like talk and make new friends. So this is the way you should form groups of people in the hallways, like getting coffee, not a circle, but a Pac-Man. 
And the third one is community plus plus. So this is a little bit tricky of math. So for every year you have attended the event, you should try to meet that many people, each, that many new people each day. So if you've gone to PyCon J two, two times, the next time you go, every day you should meet two new people. And you should introduce them to the community, you should introduce them to your friends, like, hey, this is a person that you're, supposed, you're probably going to like, talk to them. And always meeting new people and always uh, creating this community love that the PyCon community has all around the world. Because it's really, really nice, but sometimes it's really, really hard. Uh, I struggle to follow these rules, these rules, but I try my best since I've learned about them. So remember, uh, encourage people to make friends and do nice things. Uh, always create a group in a Pac-Man shape, and every year try to meet as many new, new people as the time you attended to that conference. And that's it. Thank you very much. You can find me on the internet there. Thank you. How many minutes? Two minutes to spare. Uh, I'm gonna just wait so you can throw socks at me. Okay, okay, okay. One, one person throw a sock at me. Oh. oh. Sorry, calm down. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, next, next person is going to be uh, Christian Christelis. I hope I pronounced that right. How much architecting does your project need and when? Actually, oh yeah, you took the sock back. I'll go throw it back at you. Okay. Oh, no slides. Oh, uh, no, okay, cool. Oh, there are, sorry, I think it's your laptop. There's a laptop there for Type C. Yeah, USB C. I actually have my laptop as well. Can you hear me? Actually, where's my laptop? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I just need to get the slide onto the right. Ah, okay. There, um, Hello, my name is Christian, and I'm going to be talking about something that's, that's been interesting to me for, for a while now, and that's how much architecting does your project need and when? Um, so, if we look at projects, they, they form a continuum. There's you building a little script to do something once off quickly, and then it's us trying to, to send people into space. And if you've got a huge project like that, obviously everything needs to be spec'd and architected up front. If you're um, doing something very small, then, um, then, well, you get emergent architecture, and then Depending on your project size, you're going to find that you might want to do some upfront and one, uh, some, um, yeah, get some emergent architecture. But if you've got some, an agile project, you normally start with a minimum viable, something that, that gives value to the users immediately, but you've got a path, like something where you want to end up in a couple of years' time. So this, so what, what I was thinking about is like, how do we apply architecture and when in this kind of circumstance? Because what often happens is we just throw new features onto our, um, onto our, our, our MVP or whatever, and our ideal starts floating away. So at these points, we get things like um, people saying, well, we need to refactor this, or we need to get a new version out, or we need to, you know, build this up from scratch. And that is expensive, and that's, that's time-consuming, and so forth. So, so, like, how could we get to a situation where we um, get to our goal without going through all these uh, dead ends? So, what we're suggesting, what was um, doing some continual, continuous architecting. So right up front, when we start with the project, we look at what are our key drivers. Does it have to be reliable? Does it have to be fast? And depending on that, we, we spec it up front and we say, look, these are the, these are the core things that we want 
our, our project to, to, um, yeah, to do. Right? These are key, key non-functional drivers, and we keep that in mind. And, and as we add new features, that's what that magnifying, those magnifying glasses are. We look at those new features, and we ask ourselves, is our architecture going to be able to support this feature? And it's a simple mind exercise, and if we say yay, we just go ahead and implement it. If, if we're like not sure, we might want to like prototype a little bit, or we um, end up going and saying, well, whoa, okay, this is going to be something very big, and we have to actually like, um, refactor a bit. And, and refactoring that bit is, is good to know up front. So um, the concept that, that SAFE talk about is like this architectural runway. And I'd like to always make sure that we've got enough space for the, the plane. I suppose the fact that we're close to the airport makes us a nice little metaphor. So we always make sure that we've got enough runway for our, our system to yeah, get in. So yeah, that's, that's my spiel. I'm sorry. Um. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, that is one minute, 40 seconds about. I actually started my timer late. Okay, so next talker up is going to be um, Sheena O'Connell, GraphQL versus REST. And uh, you can use this to speed things up. I, I like that. I you like that? My hands. Yeah. Okay, she likes using her hands. Yeah, actually, I probably should be starting the timer earlier because these things are running quicker than expected. I, I stop the timer when they open their mouths, but uh, maybe earlier, when they plug the laptop in. <laughs> that is very smart. Then PyCon will never end. It'll just go on and on, and never we'll be able to stop them. <coughs> hmm. ah. I haven't opened my mouth yet. Uh, actually, you have. Shh, Look. Shh. Have I? Crap. Okay. It's cool. not in your head. So, <laughs> all right, I'm ready. GraphQL versus REST. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with GraphQL, here's a basic rundown. It is a uh, text-based query language. The basic premise is that data often looks like a graph, right? Uh, so you want to be able to query that graph by traversing that graph and visiting the various nodes and just taking what you want from the various nodes. So um, one of the really cool things is that the schema itself of your query language is a part of the graph. So you get to query that as well. So it's super, super like introspectable, very, very discoverable, which is awesome. Saves a lot of time. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about Graphene uh, Mongo, which is a Python tool. There are other Python tools. Oh, my laptop battery is going to run out of power. Uh, we'll see what happens. Hopefully it'll last five minutes. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, this is some code. So I have a bunch of Mongo models here. Um, so it's pretty simple. We have an employee. Employees have tasks and roles and departments. And then I've got a schema for, for that as well. So we've got a department. just points to the department model. We have a role. It just points to the role model. It's fairly, fairly straightforward. I'm going to get rid of that error. Um, and here is this thing called graphical. And Graphical is cool because it lets you explore your stuff. So it's just a tool that you can use to play with your existing APIs. So, well, not APIs, it's uh, yeah, your, your schema. Um, so I'm not going to go through this in great detail because there are loads and loads of really great uh, tutorials out there, lots of resources. Um, what I'm going to show you is that I can query my database. So I've just played that, uh, and I've fetched a whole lot of employees over here. And my schema, you can explore it on the right-hand side, and that's lovely. So you can see, like, I've got my, my uh, department name is being queried, and the department name is over here, human resources. Isn't that nice? Now, the difference between GraphQL and, and REST is primarily based on the fact that REST 
relies on HTTP and GraphQL is just text, which you can send over HTTP if you want to. So REST um, allows you to leverage things like HTTP caching, um, HTTP like content type negotiations, whereas GraphQL doesn't have that stuff. If you want caching, you need to put it somewhere else, not at the HTTP level. So it's usually done by some kind of client, or you can do it on your database. Um, and it doesn't do content type negotiations, it does JSON. If you want to do content type negotiations, then you have to hack it to pieces, and it's not really that recommended. Um, so that's a major difference, and most other differences are derived from that fact. So um, another thing is uh, HTTP errors. So REST has the dreaded 500 error. So if you've done web programming, you've, you make a view, you make it problem in your view, an error, and you get a 500 whenever you call it. It's very annoying because there could be like one little problem and everything breaks. You get no information back. GraphQL, um, the errors are per field. So I'm going to go back to my schema over here and I'm going to uncomment this error. So now in my department schema um, object, I have an error that will get raised every time I try and check the name of that object. Um, so if I go back to this and I play it, here I'm getting a permission error, which is what I expected. And if I go back to the data that's returned, I'm still getting everything that I, that I had before, except my department isn't returning anything. And that's great, because it means not everything breaks, just the broken things look broken. Um, and that's quite cool. Um, the only problem is that like, these messages are just strings. You need to make your own kind of um, notations around that, your own, like there isn't a standard, it's just a string. Um, notice also that it's a permission error that I just made up, but um, <laughs> One really cool thing about uh, Graphene is that it has lots of hooks. So you can effectively um, implement, oh crap. You can, effecti <laughs> you can effectively implement uh, cell level permissions with GraphQL, which is great. Like you can, instead of just saying, um, yeah, you can have like the, the thing that calls your resolvers um, check permissions on, on various things. So that's quite nice. Um, Oh, they're getting ready with their socks. I could hear you guys. You're Shit. wasting time. Oh, I think I, uh, Focus, uh, calm down. Oh, right, I'm on the last slide. Okay, <laughs> cool. So um, the other difference is that REST, you tend to have lots and lots of endpoints. GraphQL, it's a string-based thing. It's one endpoint. Um, GraphQL, you use like uh, the body of your, of your query, of your request uh, to send your query string. Uh, so you don't really have access to that body for other things. Whereas with REST, you do, you get to like upload files and stuff. So that, that's yeah, something that you wouldn't do with GraphQL. And the end, ha, check that out. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, I did it. <laughs> okay, so technically she finished with about four seconds to spare. So good benchmark. Alrighty, so the next person up is going to be Whitney Tennant. The photon, what this particle has to do with building better software and living the good life. And I hope you take a mic to speed things up. Are you okay with that? All the speakers want... <laughs> okay, after this I'm going to take the thing for myself. Okay, just a little note, we're running a little longer than expected, so we're reducing the time to four minutes. <laughs> uh, sorry, it's, it's time constraints, it's the re reality of a conference. Oh yeah, you opened your mouth, sorry, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Life so um, this is the story of the photon. Um, I cannot see my speaker notes. Can somebody please help me? <laughs> Where is your mouth? Oh. There's internet. Thank you. Okay, Go. cool. So, um, today I'm telling the story of the photon uh, mostly because of its role in uh, wave particle duality. So, Max Planck discovered the quantum and it was the name he gave to an individual packet of energy. 
In about 1900, he did some experiments and was forced to um, accept that the energy of light could only be emitted or absorbed uh, by matter in small bits bundled up into various sizes. So the long-established idea was that uh, energy was emitted or absorbed continuously, like water flowing from a tap. Light was found to be emitted and absorbed in the form of quanta, and this was the work of Einstein's uh, photoelectric effect. So when these particles of light went traveling through space, they appeared as vibrating electric and magnetic fields, which showed all the characteristic behaviors of waves. Uh, but they can behave as a particle with a definite uh, position and momentum, but not both at the same time. So um, physicists had to start accepting this weird dual nature to matter, and depending on what they chose to observe, they would see different things. Humans are similar. Uh, so you'll notice different aspects of our behavior in different conditions. Now, it may seem obvious, but I think that more often than not, we tend to fix particular ideas about ourselves and others. We know uh, people and certain char characteristics and formulate opinions, and it can take a, quite a lot to shift those opinions or it doesn't really get shifted, and you think, of, uh, you think of yourself or a person in the same light for a very long time. So um, you may be used to saying things like, um, I'm just hot-tempered. Uh, we're taught to love and accept ourselves unconditionally without really meaning to deny it. Without really meaning to, we deny ourselves seeing ourselves as mutable. The more we repeat self-talk, the deeper it gets ingrained. Our personalities are not really as fixed as we think they are. We're mostly just a collection of emotions, tendencies, and learned patterns. So changing ourselves and our behavior is something that happens actively through our daily interactions. We should use an iterative approach. So let's say you work with a really grumpy senior developer, and uh, your relationship, that relationship may negatively affect the way that you see yourself. So, as Sheena has once said, assholes have a blast radius. You may figure out that uh, they really like Monty Python, and uh, you decide to include a GIF in your pull request that makes them laugh, or you try to approach the situation from a different angle that can be helpful instead of shutting yourself off just because you see them as grumpy. So, the photon and this business of dual nature of reality has shown us a different worldview without it all being wishy-washy ancient philosophy. Uh, we've shifted from the mechanistic worldview describing the universe as a machine composed of elementary building blocks, and instead, we now see the world as organic, describing the material world as, as a network of inseparable patterns of relationships. Improving the daily relationships between the nodes has a greater impact on the whole when you see things more like an ecosystem. Here in Africa, we use the term Ubuntu, which um, you may know as the popular Linux distribution. It means, I am because we are. These days, because we're seeing the values of interdisciplinary networks, people have realized that living systems, in contrast to mechanical systems, are characterized by their relations, with their properties being different from those of smaller parts. Being part of a complex society. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, okay. that's it. Round of applause. <laughs> See, if I wasn't being so mean, she would have finished well and well within, within five minutes, right? Yeah, see, so I was just being a little mean. I know. Although uh, there's a lot of pent up frustration in the audience because they have all these socks. Okay, next person is uh, Mary Rector. I believe that's that. Yeah, yes. Uh, what not to do when your Docker Django app is consuming Vault secrets? Um, also, would you.
Okay, hello. Um, just a show of hands, who wants to or is using HashiCorp's Vault uh, for secret management? Okay, well, in the future, when, um, when this stuff is popular, I hope you remember me, and this, and this wretched talk. Oh, shit. Um, it turns out I don't understand how Linux and stuff works. Hello? It's a mirrored screen, but it's a mirrored screen, but it's not mirroring. Okay, okay, apply changes. Yes, mom. All right. Yay. Yay. Okay. Um, yes. This is a uh, very pressure. Okay. Um, all right. So, what not to do? In the end, when you figure it out, it's not nice to keep passing secrets around in open like confetti. Uh, you might decide to use a secret management service to store um, and broker secrets. So what happens when your Django app wants to consume them? Well, we have tried this, and here's what not to do. So here on the left, I've got Vault, which is your secret management service. On the other side, you've got a container Django app. Um, in general, the way the container and the app authenticates the Vault that says, yes, I can fetch these secrets, that is left to the reader. I have some other talks you can have a look at. But that's out of scope. But how about de delivering the first secret to the consumer? So the container needs to tell the secret management service, hi, here's me. I can consume secrets. Um, the way this is done is usually um, it fetches a wrapped token um, that allows it to access the rest of the secrets from Vault. So why wrapped? Because um, the way it gets to the container might go through a series of tubes and it might have a lot of intermediary services where it goes through. And you don't actually want those to have access to Vault, just your end container. All right, so what, what shouldn't you do? First thing is don't inject creds as environment variables. I know if you work with containers, this is a very popular pattern. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm a security person, so uh, it's an anti-pattern to me. It's really easy to leak in debug mode and in logs, uh, especially Django debug mode spits out your environment variables, so no. Easy to leak if your environment is inherited for remote calls. So if you make remote calls from a child environment and you make it to somewhere that you don't really trust and they have access to the environment, Leakage. Easy to leak during transit to the container. So if you've got these raw creds and you want to inject them, well, wherever those, wherever the intermediary points needs to get through to inject those, they have access to those creds. Increase your attack surface. Next thing to do is don't initialize or fetch credentials in your settings.py because this is really, it's intuitive, but it's not good. So we used G-Unicorn as our WSGI interface. The first G-Unicorn worker, if you have more than one worker process, the first one gets to unwrap that token. The rest, GLHF, you don't get, you're kind of slow. Um, the next thing is if you do network calls and expensive operations in settings.py, it will end you up in debug hell because it's really, really difficult to do that. So. The next thing to do using Docker files, don't initialize or fetch creds in your Docker file because you have no guarantee that your credentials will get fetched before your app is launched. Docker doesn't really have an init system, so if it did have an init system, you'd probably do it there, but it doesn't at the moment, and you can't guarantee that app starts after your creds already. So in the end, what you do, make a supervising process. The supervising process does all the fetching for you um, and then spawns the Django app as a sub-process. So please do use this pattern. Um, yeah, so we did a Python implementation of this. Why Python? Not practical, but this is PyCon. So it wraps Django app in the supervising process, fetches the creds and writes the file, renews the creds and cleans up the creds when they expire. What's so funny? Uh, okay, all right. And then there's also an adapter that I wrote that consumes Please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a shockingly good time management aid. <laughs> okay, next up is Nicholas uh, Gregoradios. Um, I, I probably pronounced it wrong, sorry. Um, HTTP client performance. All right, yeah. Can I start? All right, okay. All right, so um, everybody loves benchmarks, right? So um, this came out because of a discussion I had with Bernard probably about half a year ago. And uh, in response to uh, Vibora, which was a 
a high performance uh, async uh, Python framework where the guy rewrote an HTTP client because the standard one provided by AIO HTTP was slow. Of course, we didn't know, so I said, okay, there was no benchmarks, and I, I did some. So anyways, we all love Python, obviously, you know, we're here. Um, and uh, we know that requests is slow. Uh, everybody's commented on that. Uh, it's a lovely, it gets rid of problems and errors, but handles weird edge cases, but it isn't fast. So the most common mistake is creating a session on every request. Doing request.get something, instead of se request um, session equals request session, and then session.get. Um, and then you really use that session over and over. It's especially useful for um, if you do connect, talk to an HTTPS service, you keep a cache of the computed uh, SSL certificate so you can, conf you don't have to recompute the whole certificate. All right, so I've done a bunch of Xbox. It was my old um, i5-630 dual-core notebook. Um, a single process against Apache. I know people say it's supposed to be slow, but I just used Apache to serve because I can turn on and off HTTP pipelining which is an important thing to test here, as in re reusing connections or not. And it was done inside a Docker image running up on Linux, and um, there's the URL to the PR, which got approved but never merged, I don't know. Anyways, so here is the sync results. So we have requests at the bottom. Hey, all right. Requests at the bottom, and it was sitting at about 600 or so um, requests a second. It's a bit slow, and when you use sessions, it's hardly faster. Come on. Then you use Eurolib 3, which is used by requests, and it's double to triple the performance. And you're like, whoa, that's interesting. And then while I was doing this, I said, hey, let's see if I can find anything else. I found Pi Cool. Well, that's like two orders of magnitude faster. It's well, more than an order of magnitude. It's like quite a difference in performance. Um, and the red line is pipelined, and the blue one is without pipeline. So you have to reuse the connection. Um, so at a certain point, it starts scaling. To there, not really. And then for the async frameworks, it shows here but not there, okay. There is many, many um, options, many more options. So AIO HTTP starts off quite a bit faster and actually scales up with many connections. And uh, there was a question earlier about if UV loop improves performance. It does. You can see that in the case of AIO HTTP, to not it's simple, to not it's cool, um, and we borrowed a client is actually the fastest async HTTP um, client. Um, well, don't use it in production yet, is all I'm saying, because it's version 0 0.06, so leave it at that. So there you have it. Um, it's not that difficult to speed up your HTTP request. I could tell that the audience is going, woohoo! <laughs> Oh, he wants it. Uh, nah. That's, there we go. OK, off. <laughs> OK, so now the next one is going to be Bruce Mary, uh, Bird, uh, Birdiesler, and, and uh, Birdile. <laughs> Birdiesler, that's a nice one. And in process, Redis for unit testing. And also, uh, this time I have informed the speakers there's actually three minutes left now for the remaining ones because we're actually already into the proper talk session. So. I am going to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have to open my mouth first. Okay. Um, so who yep. here uses Redis? Okay, that's what I thought. I heard it mentioned quite a few times at the conference. Well, I thought I'd actually do this talk. So. Uh, if you haven't seen Redis, it's an in-memory database. It's a key-value store, but also has various other things. It does lists and sorted sets and all the rest. So if you use it, you have to connect to a Redis server. And if you're writing unit tests, that's a bit of a pain because now you've got to have a server somewhere and you've got to connect to it. So who uses fake Redis or mock Redis? A few people. Okay. I've ended up inheriting uh, maintainership of fake Redis because it had been kind of abandoned and I was contributing pull requests to it. So. I'm stuck with it, but it's uh, but it's a real pain to kind of s emulate all the things that Redis does because Redis is actually a massively complicated piece of software. So I've now started 
instead trying to actually take the Redis code base and rip it out of being a standalone server and stuff it into a library. And Birdal is a, an anagram of libredis. But it's a bit of a pain because it does all kinds of things that you don't really want your library to do. It has global states, so if you have more than one of these, it's, they're going to stomp on each other. It runs signal handlers. It messes with your locale. It forks. You know, it's going to spew stuff to your standard error without going through the Python logging framework. So I've been doing a bit of work. It's not finished yet. Just kind of ripping out all these things and making a simpler version uh, that you can stuff into a library and connect to. And you know, it's still if you try and do the wrong things with it, it will probably explode. But for most stuff, you can see it works exactly the same as Redis, except you don't have a separate server you have to connect to. And um, also, I'm planning to have an AIO Redis lookalike, which will uh, be exactly the same as AIO Redis, but uh, again, with an in-process in server. Uh, I've been hacking on that today. It's again not ready. So, But if you're interested, uh, go look at Bird Isle and Bird Isle Pi on GitHub and follow them, and hopefully it'll soon be ready for actual use. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, the final one um, is Tofik Okards. Everybody wants to be a blogger. Um, hi everyone. Um, yeah, just to say I don't. Um, I hope I don't like. Um, yeah, no, your time started. Insult anyone? Okay, cool. So it's the rules. I'm sorry. Out. I made them, but still. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So. Okay, sorry, that's like five minutes. Um, five. Okay, so I got two minutes, and so he's starting with his joke. Um, keep settings, keep changes, uh, present. Okay, cool. So let's just go to slide one. Well, okay, cool. So uh, yeah, the talk is everyone wants to be a blogger. Everybody wants to show these skills. Everyone wants to get there faster, make their way to the top of Hacker News. Um, you know, if you know Pokemon, you probably get that. Um, so yeah, it's also I hope that any more of those Python vouchers, which is lightning speakers this year. But it's actually uh, static content management with Lector. So content management primer. Um, you're probably gonna if you. Uh, if you went into CMS, you probably heard of WordPress or you heard of other stuff. Uh, or you heard of Medium and some other hip stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so your blog architecture looks something like this. You probably have some data over there. Um, you have like your uh, kitchen sinks and you have some system Java and then it's kind of delivered over there, right? But then what if you don't like a dirty kitchen, right? So you kind of have some flat files and you kind of do something to it and it becomes CSS. HTML JavaScript, and then you can host it anywhere you can host it, right? So static site generators, um, what are they about? Um, you can check out staticsitegenerator.com if you don't want. If you actually like want to really read about it, there's a cool article by someone called Carl Rush and like how they created a platform for Obama's campaign. And um, okay, so hosting is cool, you can host it anywhere, but there's also something called the Jamstack, but you don't really want to go to the Jamstack because there's quite a lot of problems. But then you come back and say, give me WordPress. Then I'm like, no, this is number one bullshit. Uh, then I'm like, no, no, WordPress. I'll give you Lector. So um, this was created by Armin, uh, the guy behind Flask. Um, yeah, I shook his hand at PyCon 2012, and then he went to do greater things. And yeah, I shook his hand. And <laughs> so Lector, if, is anything from this talk, remember, Lector is a Python package. It's not a static site generator. If you're in Cape Town, this is how I install it. You just go pip install Lector or pip inf. If you're not from Cape Town, you're probably going to do something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Lector quick start. You just go Lector quick start. You go serve and um, puts up the thing. It has a back end for your editing and you can build HTML files. So go out there, create content. 